and thanks for listening to the My Care Champion cast. For those who don't know, it's currently Patient Safety Awareness Week. When it comes to advancing healthcare safety, data is one of our strongest tools. With this in mind, our MHA Keystone Center Patient Safety Organization collects data every day from hospitals and health systems throughout Michigan to improve patient and worker safety. As a continuation of this work, the Keystone team assembled the Adverse Events Review Committee, also known as ARC, to not only review specific adverse events in hospitals, but to examine the data and trends on a larger scale and identify the root cause of medical errors so that we can provide our members with actionable solutions for improving safety. Today, we have two members of the ARC committee here to share more about this work and explain why hospitals should prioritize submitting adverse event data. They'll also share more about what steps hospitals can take to improve the culture around safety reporting and why that's so important. The first guest I'll introduce is Nadine Post, co-chair of the ARC committee, registered nurse, and current manager of quality and patient safety at My Michigan Health. In her 42 years in the profession, Nadine acquired specialties in critical care, surgical services, and hospice. She's been leading quality and patient safety for the last 11 years, and in her tenure has remained a visionary in the field of patient safety and zero harm. Nadine, thanks for being here today. Appreciate you having me. The second guest we have is Nicole Steffen, Manager of Risk Management and Patient Safety at Trinity Health Livonia. Nicole began her 19-year career as a nuclear medicine technologist and continued her clinical role working in invasive cardiology. In her current position, she has implemented system-wide risk, safety, accreditation, patient experience, and quality improvement programs for multiple health systems. Nicole, welcome to the MyCare Champion Cast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm so grateful to have you both. I think this is going to be a really good and informative conversation about patient safety and the importance that data provides us in that space. So I always like to kick things off introducing our listeners to our guests. So Nadine, can you kick us off just sharing a little bit more about your current role and what led you to healthcare and then what led you into the quality and safety space specifically? Sure, I'd be happy to share that. First of all, what led me into healthcare, interestingly enough, because I've been in the profession for 42 years, is I wasn't that typical young girl that wanted to be a nurse. But at the time when I graduated high school, there were no jobs. I wasn't going to college at the time. And it was the only job available in our local community hospital. So I started working in a role there in nursing and and really loved it as a nurse's aide and just continued to build on my profession from there. Mm -hmm. I spent many years getting a lot of experience and expertise in different areas through nursing Mm -hmm. and then moved into leadership about 22 years ago and really had the passion to start doing larger things on a more global scale to really see how it can help and be an impact for patient safety and Mm -hmm. improving things. So about 10, 11 years ago, I got into quality and patient safety and really started looking at the patient safety piece of it. And how do we really start improve and looking at fixing our systems that we have Mm -hmm. and getting to that zero harm that is so important, we should always be targeting for in healthcare. Right. That's amazing. And it's good that you have the clinical experience to inform what you're doing in the safety space as well. So, Nicole, what about you? I always wanted to work in healthcare. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. So I became a nuclear medicine technologist, and my first role actually was at Trinity Health, Mm -hmm. uh, first at Ann Arbor and then in Livonia, where I work now. And prior to that, I worked at the Ann Arbor location where I did my training and remained a contingent for several years. From there, I worked at the Detroit Medical Center in invasive cardiology, Mm -hmm. and I began to work on performance improvement at the departmental level, and then I had the opportunity to work at the operational level to lead performance improvement initiatives across the hospital and then across the health system. Mm. And at that time, there was a high level of focus on implementing the Lean Six Sigma methodology to improve patient care, reduce waste, eliminate defects. And I was one of the leaders that was able to drive those initiatives. Hmm. From that position, I moved on to different management roles in risk safety, quality, and accreditation. And I had the opportunity to work at McLaren Healthcare as well as a corporate manager of clinical risk and patient safety. And our focus at that time was standardizing patient safety, working on risk management programs across the health system. And I also had the opportunity to work with many hospitals across the state. So it gave me a good knowledge of, you know, how hospitals function, you know, the different layouts, different opportunities, and the other challenges that we're all facing, you know, across our health systems. So then I returned to Trinity Health as accreditation leader. So I have a strong accreditation background. And then my current role, you know, working daily on improving safety quality and managing, you know, clinical risk and non-clinical risk. 
And then as Nadine said, you know, we're working on our patient safety program and a high level of focus on proactively preventing adverse events. So Mm -hmm. the shift over a number of years is more of the proactive approach instead of the reactive approach. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you both have so much experience and knowledge in this topic. It's going to be, I can't imagine talking to two better people about this topic. So to dive into the conversation, you are here because you're both members of our Adverse Events Review Committee. And I'm just curious if you can share a little bit of background on that committee, the work that you do and how it came to be. Yes. Yeah, so I got involved in this committee back, I would say, about two years or so ago when My Michigan Health rejoined the Keystone Center PSO. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to take the opportunities to participate in the different types of committees or whatever that was going on. Right. So they had the root cause analysis committee, which is something that's very near and dear to my heart. That's mm-hmm. That's what the work myself and my team do on a daily basis. So I joined that committee, and it was at the time we would review root cause analysis from adverse events that had happened that hospitals had reported. One of the things I think we discovered as we were going through that is identifying that the work product submitted to the PSO for root cause analysis was all over the place. There were Mm -hmm. homegrown products people were using. There were vendor products people were using. It was just a vast array and and not really always a rhyme or reason to to, uh, standardize what it looked like when it was coming to the committee. So we would review those cases. They would be summarized. And then there would be alerts put out from the MHA to all of the member hospitals. So that was what we were doing at that point in time. But we started looking at what more can we do? Mm -hmm. One of the biggest problems, I think, when we look at the committee members that were on the committee, which are all the same types of professionals we are working in the same fields, is adverse events is just that little sliced cheese we're working on. Mm -hmm. But we have all these other things that we have to do as far as investigating when events happen. How do we get to proactive states? How do we get accountability of the leaders we're working with to participate and carry on those action plans that we have. And then also, how do we improve the culture of safety so people are comfortable reporting? So we started looking at all of those opportunities and decided that we need to restructure the committee. And with Clarence Rucker's uh, guidance and leadership, um, we've worked through that and really have started to do a lot of work in those arenas and identify some pain points that we've had there. So That's what sparked the start of this committee. Mm -hmm. Uh, We started in June of last year, and we've done a tremendous amount of work, actually, in a very short period of time. That's amazing. And then I can give it to Nicole because she joined a little bit later, so we can get her perspective on that, too. Yeah, what has your experience been? So far, I really like it. I really enjoy it. There's so much knowledge. Uh, The last meeting we were at, I'm looking around the table and I'm like, wow, there's over 100 years of experience, you Mm -hmm. know, at this table talking about the same challenges that we're having, you know, the same barriers. How do we overcome them? Mm -hmm. And it's really great to collaborate with people that do the same work because, you know, they're also, you know, working with, you know, the leadership teams looking for opportunities of how do we navigate through these, you know, uncharted territories, you know, in our healthcare system. So analyzing the adverse events and identifying best practice and event investigation and collaboration with the different organizations is so important Mm -hmm. to optimize our learning management and our own professional development. Right. Um, And I think that, you know, you can say that together we're stronger, right? Mm -hmm. So multiple health systems, small hospitals, big hospitals, a lot of people that have different backgrounds, right? So we're a multidisciplinary committee, which has been very at our advantage of trying to, uh, you know, collaborate and talk about, you know, what our goals are and things like that. So, you know, the goal of the committee is, you know, when we talk about creating a playbook to outline the process for learning management and engagement and then investigation process and action planning, and then also leadership oversight, as Nadine mentioned, because it's so important to have leadership engagement and involvement, you know, through our processes when we have adverse events. Absolutely. It seems like something you'd need someone at every level. And to your point, like in different disciplines of healthcare need to be involved. And even if one hospital doesn't experience a certain adverse event, they're benefiting from learning from others. And I imagine that everything you're taking away from this is beneficial to everybody who's involved. Is it 
true that the for the root cause analysis committee, what originated how the Adverse Events Review Committee came to be, was that more looking at like case by case scenarios? And this is now you're taking kind of a broader approach to adverse events and looking at more like trends and um, things that are happening on a, a bigger scale. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was case by case basis. So we'd mm-hmm. meet quarterly, we'd review one or two root cause analysis that were the same types of themes. Right. Which was great because there was a lot of great knowledge that came out of that. But and you're still doing that. And, and we still do that. Right. Yes. Right. Just want to make sure everybody knows we're yes. still looking at yes. that and, and putting out those alerts as we identify things. Mm-hmm. But we wanted to look at what more can we do to help those professionals out there that are doing this work, not only to standardize some of the processes, but regardless of the amount of resources that you have, because in our small critical access hospitals, one person wears all those hats. Right. There are other health systems that have a huge team that works on it. So regardless of the amount of people and the resources you have working, what kind of tools can we produce for those folks? The other piece of that, too, is there, from my experience working in quality and patient safety, there's a lot of best practices out there. There's a lot of different methodologies to do event investigation. Ultimately, it all leads to the same ending as you get through things. Mm -hmm. But there are nuances into how the processes go. But there's not a lot of training out there. There's risk management training. Risk management's a huge, huge umbrella. Mm -hmm. Um, So how do we really focus on that patient safety piece, get people not working so much with the slice of Swiss cheese that has happened that Mm -hmm. we have to deal with, which we still need to. Right. But then how do we go more proactive, help build that culture of safety, help our organizations that work with us to understand building that culture is so important, but it requires from the executive top all the way to every employee staff member, volunteer, provider that you have right. walking through your doors. So yeah, that was kind of the focus of how do we start putting some tools and best practices out there for folks like yeah. that. Yeah. And I want to definitely get into more of the culture piece because I think that's something people don't realize is it plays such a huge role in collecting adverse data and why hospitals are sometimes resistant to sharing that information. But before we get to that, I do want to ask, Obviously, we know that collecting adverse event data is critical for informing and improving um, healthcare safety and quality. Can both of you provide some examples of how this data has informed safety and quality improvement efforts in Michigan? Well, I think, you know, data is very important, right? Because data is knowledge and it tells you the full picture. It allows us to see, you know, where we're vulnerable. It also allows us to benchmark across, you know, like Trinity Health is a large health system, so we can benchmark across ourselves. We can benchmark across other hospitals. And so that's helpful. Or we can benchmark, you know, even nationally, right, towards other hospitals across the U.S. And the importance of sharing information allows us to, you know, look at those different benchmarks to say, you know, are we meeting the expectations or are we not, you know, internally or externally. And so that helps us, you know, prioritize what work we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. Because the one thing in healthcare is that you have a lot of different initiatives that are all kind of simultaneously being worked on, right? Right. And there's different people that lead those different process improvement initiatives. Mm -hmm. Um, You might have managers on the front line. You might have quality or safety people. You might have leadership that are your executive champions. And so that really helps us look at what we need to focus on if we're not meeting up to the expectations and we know that there's opportunities in our generally accepted practice standards that we need to address. Right. Um, and so that's very important. And I think on a local level, like when we, when we look at our incident reporting system or our adverse events, you know, that also tells us a story. And I mm-hmm. think that's why it's so important to be participating in a patient safety organization, because what is everyone else experiencing? How can we share that knowledge? How can we tackle those issues? And how can we really define, you know, what's best practice or how we can do a risk assessment across our organization so that we are not vulnerable to those risks? Right. Do you have any specific examples of a best practice that has come to be through the work of the committee, or is that still something that's, I I imagine it takes a long time to come up with a cohesive best practice for safety and quality efforts. 
I can give you an example of something that came from some cases that we reviewed after we had transitioned to the art committee. So in in those folks out here that are going to be listening to this in the healthcare world can probably relate to it. We know since COVID, there are longer stays in the emergency departments for patients waiting to be transferred, admitted. Um, we had a case like that in one of our hospitals that a patient had an extended stay. Uh, there was some diagnosis missed from that particular patient because we know emergency departments aren't inpatient units. Mm-hmm. They're emergency departments. So they're doing that medical screen and they're having to move on to the next patient. And And there were some adverse outcomes for that particular patient. I won't go into details. But as we reviewed all of that, what really came to light with that was it's probably time for organizations to look at setting some standard basic care guidelines Mm -hmm. for those patients that are extended stays. So Mm -hmm. that was one of the recommendations that came out of the ARC committee as Mm -hmm. we were reviewing those types of things. So that's just one example yeah. Of, of that. One of the other things that's been beneficial being part of the MHA PSO is the safe tables that they do. And that, and that is some work that also covers different adverse events as well. Mm-hmm. So that's really helpful to bring additional best practices that we may see coming out of those types of things. Yeah, I, I want to get into some of the trends you're seeing in your work collecting data, but I do wonder what are some of the most common adverse events that are happening in hospitals? You mentioned extended stays in ERs, and I don't think people recognize the safety concerns that come with an extended stay at a hospital, but I know that's probably one of them. What others would you say are most common in hospitals? I think we're seeing a lot of sepsis cases that are Mm -hmm. becoming more common with adverse events, Mm -hmm. falls with trauma. That's more common as well. We see those types of things, misdiagnoses. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things we're seeing in our world is radiology misreads and those types of things. And Mm -hmm. and I'm sure these are not unique to any one organization, but uh, those are some of the more common things we see in the adverse events. And again, we want to identify those trends and get best practices out for all of that. But then turning the dial and start saying, okay, this is all the Swiss cheese we're working in, Mm -hmm. and we're putting out learning information from that, which is extremely important. Right. But how do we proactively start preventing Mm -hmm. these events before they even become events? And that is really where we start talking about the culture of the organizations, increasing your reporting, Mm -hmm. having that psychological safety so that your staff your employees, your providers feel comfortable reporting these potential safety events. That's where you get the near misses, the workarounds that clinicians do on a daily basis because they don't have the right process or the equipment. Mm -hmm. And it puts patients and not only patients, but clinicians at risk as well. They're licensed professionals. That is risky at times too. So, So how do we then as this art committee start putting a focus on that pieces of it too, of really that proactive prevention Mm -hmm. before we have to get to the point where we're reviewing the adverse event. Right. You have to know the problem to find a solution to then prevent the problem, which I think is probably, it's it's a tricky situation because I imagine hospitals don't want to share the near misses or the, the things that happen that are adverse, but at the end of the day, that's helpful and it helps create a safer environment in our hospitals. Is there anything you would add to that list of common um, safety concerns in hospitals that you see in your work? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that I've seen over multiple healthcare systems is sometimes so simplistic. And one thing that I is a common theme is, you know, patient identification. It's one of our national patient safety goals, you know, just to do a correct verification process of a patient, mm-hmm. things that are within your control. And that can spiral to other errors, right? Medication errors, things like that. Uh, right. Medication errors is obviously one of our higher occurrences across, you know, multiple health systems again. One thing that we were challenged by is that we have the EPIC system that for our electronic medical record that was implemented before COVID, three Mm -hmm. months before. So one of those things is maximizing and optimizing our electronic medical record. Was that helpful during COVID or was it 
hard because it was a newly implemented system. Yeah, it was hard because it's newly implemented. And then Mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, you go into disaster charting. So it's just a little bit a difference of documentation, Mm -hmm. but a lot of heavy lifting trying to look at those near misses. But the near misses are so important because a lot of times people think like if I did something wrong or something was wrong, then I would put in an incident report. But changing that mindset that if there's a near miss or there's an error that was caught before it reached the patient or before it caused harm, you know, it's important to report that as well, because that allows us to look at that process and fix it before it causes harm. So, you know, we've done a lot of work on our Good Catch program and, you know, working with MHA and modeling their Speak Up program, which has been very successful and Mm -hmm. really widely accepted amongst our management team and all of our um, staff members as well. So I think just, you know, having some type of system that people are encouraged to report right. and to take the time to report, mm-hmm. you know, because part of their daily practices, it's very hard to take the time to actually, you know, communicate, you know, what those problems are. And sometimes we're working in silos. So if one nursing department's having an issue and they're not reporting it, they know that there's an issue. But we might mm-hmm. not know on the organizational level that there's an issue. Right. Yeah. Well, I, it's, I'm glad you brought up the Speak Up Awards because I was going to ask if celebrating the employees who are reporting adverse events is helping because I think that is a great way to kind of turn the tide towards celebrating that we should be doing that and it should be, you know, something that is recognized on the state level, like people should be seeing that information and and knowing that our healthcare workers are on top of identifying when things aren't going right. And they're making a point of correcting the problems that exist. So I appreciate you bringing that up. When you are reviewing the adverse event data, what what is the committee seeing right now in terms of trends? and, And what are you working on currently? Well, again, right now we're reviewing case by case. So it's mm-hmm. really hard to identify overall trends with that. Right because it's more of a case-by-case basis. One of the things certainly we've identified as a committee that the amount of reports that get uploaded into NextPlain where we report our data Mm -hmm. for root cause analysis are not a huge volume at all, probably in just the double figures that, that we see those. And, and it's interesting when we get all of our committee together and all of the different people in that committee and the work that they do to start talking about doing root cause analysis and all of that. So mm-hmm. uh, my team had standardized our processes a few years ago because we wanted to start doing more root cause analysis on those near miss events and those mm-hmm. types of things to really start being proactive. And and uh, in the eight years I've been at my Michigan, the first year I started there, we did eight root causes for the whole year. Mm. This last year, my team of six did 190. Wow. Now, that being said, the only ones we report to the PSO are ones that were a serious safety event or a sentinel event. Mm -hmm. Uh, And part of that reasoning being there is a standard, so to speak, in the leapfrog survey that is a standard that you report any never events serious safety events to an external organization Mm -hmm. within X amount of days of the event. So so in order to meet that requirement, we also started doing that. Mm -hmm. But now imagine, as we've talked with our art committee, if my team was doing all 190 of those, and if Nicole's teams were doing all of the ones they were doing, and everybody was reporting those, Mm -hmm. that's our opportunity to really start looking at trends. Right Now, we report all of our patient safety event data to the PSO. So that is within their next plane software. And that data is there. We haven't, as a committee, even started having conversations about that piece of it yet. But really looking at any event you're investigating and coming up with a summary, Mm -hmm. how do we get more of that to this committee? Because that's where we can really start making huge impacts and looking at um, having a bigger effect and getting those best practices out on those types of trends that we're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Anything you'd add there, Nicole? Yeah, I think that the one thing is, is that, again, you know, how do we put that in our practice to make sure that we take the time to upload, you know, when we have certain and maybe beyond, you know, sentinel events or serious safety events? And because it is optional, right? But there's so much value to it and to emphasize that value and shared learning. 
because I think the shared learning is so important and MHA can help us, you know, evolve and also help distribute that information so that other people can use it and we can develop best practices. So just really enforcing, you know, what Nadine said and then also you know, just taking the time to report the PSO is so important. Absolutely. Yeah. And we encourage all our member hospitals to submit the data, get involved in the PSO as much as you can. Are you looking for more committee members? We will take every committee member you can find us. Okay, Because good. the more knowledge <laughs> in the room, the better it is. And, yeah. And then the more work we can do as a committee. I mean, the, the work we've done so far, uh, we spent our first in-person meeting just looking at what is every pain point we all have as professionals in this role in the work that we do. And it was a lot. It was a lot. So we had to start narrowing that down and focusing. And that's how we came up with our three priority areas. First, the the investigation piece of it, mm -hmm. the leadership piece of it, the learning management piece of it. Those were, you know, primary things. Mm -hmm. And then I think out of that investigation piece, as we talked more and more, is what can we offer as a committee and what kind of product maybe can come from all of that, that potentially we could have training sessions for new individuals going into these roles. What I've seen historically in the past when there's a quality patient safety risk management type of role available and they hire from within the organization, oftentimes it's a clinical person, but not always a clinical person. There's not a lot of training for that. Mm. It is kind of what I have seen in all of the roles I've had in quality and safety. You got to figure it out and build your own processes and your own role. So how can we put some standardized things out there that people can look at and work their way through? Yeah, I know even leadership in my hospital, we still struggle on the leadership side when there's events being put in and they have to do follow-up. They, they struggle with, well, what am I supposed to do with this? What do you want me to do with this? And yeah. So how do we kind of build all those resources for the professionals that are doing the work to bring back to their organization and reach the, all of those levels they need to, to reach? Absolutely. And I think it's, it's well known that every facet of healthcare is understaffed right now and, and a lot of teams need support. So I want to ask the question, what do you find most rewarding about working in safety and quality? For me, it is creating our healthy communities together, which apps is actually our purpose at My Michigan Health. But what I really mean by that, for me, it's we have healthcare services across many, many counties and in the Upper Peninsula. And I travel to all of those, as some of my family does. Mm -hmm. If I go into any of those organizations that are part of my organization, I would expect the same safe care everywhere. So for me, it is creating that level of safety and helping support that, helping build that culture of safety, reducing that harm, having people understanding and reporting that when they do that, that's going to improve and make the organization move towards zero harm. Mm -hmm. I want to feel safe there. If I go to Nicole's hospital that she's sitting in right now, mm -hmm. I'm going to know that she's doing the job that needs to be done and helping keep that organization safe and keeping their patients and their employees safe right. from harm. So that is really what gives me the reward. Mm -hmm. The other piece is being a part of groups like this with my peers and my colleagues that I get to hear the same struggles I've been dealing with for many years, but we're actually working together as a team yeah. to do some great work that's going to help people in the future as they move forward with this. So that that's where my reward comes from. Absolutely. What about you, Nicole? The one thing that I really like about this job is that, you know, you're a change agent and you get to work with a lot of disciplines across, you know, the healthcare system. And we're all looking to identify, you know, remove barriers, system failures, and trying to improve quality and deliver, you know, highly effective evidence-based healthcare. And I don't think that there, I can't see me being in a more rewarding job and trying to improve those care and services. Mm -hmm. Personally, you know, my family experienced the Sentinel event, you know, many years ago that affected us forever, right? And so I think that work really resonates with me. And then it also gives me the 
energy and the tenacity to, you know, work on this type of challenges that we have and trying to bring the right people together. Because a lot of times we're just facilitating the right people in the room, organizing the work, the data, looking at the trends and organizing it in a way that people can interpret it. They understand the problem. They understand why it needs to be addressed. They're looking and identifying all the gaps and, you know, trying to put those processes in place to make sure that we provide safer care. Right. Um, and so that, I believe, is very rewarding because sometimes that process might take you three months, six months, nine months when you're looking at more of a complex chronic issue, mm -hmm. but the reward is large. Right. And that's a great feeling. And plus, you're not alone. You're never alone in this role. You know, you're also a champion along with your executive leadership team, mm -hmm. you know, your managers, your directors, and you're still all trying to obtain that same goal. And that's a great feeling. I would add one more thing to yeah. that, too, that I think all of us in the role would feel the same way as it was it's really re rewarding when we go into a room where we have some of the care team that's actually been involved in the event mm -hmm. often those are high emotionally driven events we know individuals in healthcare do not go to work every day thinking a patient's going to be harmed so when something happens it's devastating to them as well mm -hmm. but then there's always been this level of fear and blame, and I can honestly say in the 42 years of healthcare I've been in, it used to be that way. Mm -hmm. You know, you made a mistake, you're the problem, we get rid of you, that mistake's never gonna happen again. Well, we know that not is not the truth right. these days. So there's always a lot of fear attached to reporting events. And if I did the mistake, you know, people are very fearful of what's going to happen. It's probably the number one barrier to having our employees report is fear. Yeah. And I think that's in any healthcare organization. So it's really rewarding for me when I'm able to be part of that group, facilitating those conversations mm -hmm. and really supporting that care team, but actually being able to talk through the event, focus on the facts, not the feelings, but acknowledge, you know, that it was very hard on the team. Right. Um, and everybody leaves that feeling much better about themselves. What mm -hmm. I've discovered, and that's one of our steps in our process, that we pull those care teams together to go through that because what we found is a lot of those folks continue to blame themselves. But when mm -hmm. they come and hear the whole process from the beginning and everybody that had the input somewhere along those processes that ended up in an adverse event, they understand that wow, this is a bigger issue than me, Yeah, right? And it could happen to anybody, I'm sure, in a lot of scenarios. Anybody, yeah. yes. Yeah, that has to be tough. And Nicole, I know you touched on the culture piece a little bit, but is there anything else, Nadine, that you would add about improving the culture? Is it the way you speak to your colleagues? Is it the way you just talk about adverse events? Like, what are the little steps that healthcare teams can take to, to make that shift to not be so fearful? I think one of the big components of building a culture of safety is certainly having your leadership supporting that, but also having those conversations and having executive leaders be at those unit levels and being active listeners as well. So that piece of it, so so that the frontline employees understand that they have executive support with all of that. Mm -hmm. Just to piggyback what Nadine said, psychological safety is so important, right? And you have all these different cultures in a hospital. You have your leadership culture at the top, executive culture. Mm -hmm. You have the departmental cultures, right? So a leader that's a manager or director over a department, their culture might be different. right? Um, so you have all these different silos that we might all have the same goal, but yet, just because the people who work in that type of environment might not feel that way. Mm -hmm. And plus, healthcare, the turnover rate is pretty rapid, right? And so you might have someone that came from a culture that was more punitive. 
Right. You know, and so how do you talk to that person or that staff member? You know, they get a quick orientation that has a lot of information about how they have to do their day-to-day work. Mm -hmm. And so what does it mean to them that they're in a non-punitive culture? What does just culture mean to them? Or have they never even been in a just culture environment or ever have training? Right. Um, So it's very important, like Nadine said, is to have that message come from your executive leadership team. Mm -hmm. And as Nadine also said, during our leader rounding, it's very important to have that visibility to have those discussions. Mm -hmm. So one thing that's taking us from good to great is that our executive team rounds three times a week and we rotate through the different departments within our hospital. And so they get to interact with staff and encourage staff to report, wow. you know, when they do have a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've seen the shift where the managers, you know, we have our daily huddle boards at the departmental level and the managers were the ones presenting them and talking about performance improvement. And now we have the staff who have stepped up wow. and, you know, they're talking about process improvement and what they're doing to make their department better, right? right? They're identifying the issues. They're the change agents now. And that's how you're going to make change across the organization is you really need to get to those frontline staff. Mm-hmm. And if they feel like they're in a psychologically safe environment, then they will take the time to report. They will feel comfortable. They will realize it's a learning environment. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the challenge is making sure that everyone knows that the same message is heard across the organization. And then another piece to that is, you know, we have a very close partnership with our resident program. So that's a huge opportunity to have a collaborative relationship with them as well, because Mm -hmm. they are the eyes and ears of the organization as well. And they Mm -hmm. can help point us to where we have vulnerabilities and where we need to make change. When we talk about culture safety for employees, Certainly what Nicole alluded to in talking about those leaders being on those units is extremely important. I think another important component of that is the executive leadership needs to commit to doing some foundational culture of safety for all their employees. Our organization did that a few years ago, and we've incorporated into new hires. So they're getting that foundational culture of safety And the content of that is identifying why it's so important. We need to have a culture of safety, talking about medical errors, talking about psychological safety, but also then we focus a lot on human error because we know humans make errors anywhere from five to six to seven of them every hour, they say. Some of us probably more often than that. However, We know that. So we don't want to punish human error when we are reviewing and investigating things that are going on. We want to look at a systems perspective and fix processes for that. So training our employees to understand that. And then the second piece of that content is introducing our five foundational safety behaviors and then different tools you can use to practice those safety behaviors. Mm. Several of the two tools come from the Team Steps program. Uh, so, for example, right now we're doing a Back to Basics campaign in our organization because we know, as Nicole also said, we have staff turning over all the time. So mm-hmm. how do we keep redosing and redosing? Because it's right. never a one and done. Right. So we're doing a Back to Basics, and our first quarter we're, t- we're focusing on here's our behaviors of having a questioning attitude and supporting your team. And here are the tools you can use to speak up. How do we speak up and use certain language that everybody knows if someone's speaking in this language? So for example, if we say we're going to cuss, we're going to say we're concerned, Mm -hmm. we're uncomfortable, and this is a safety issue. And when you teach everybody that and they hear those words, people then stop and say, okay, we need to regroup and talk about this as a team before right. we move on. Yeah. So so I think it's very important to build culture of safety. You have to set those expectations, but also give people tools how to feel comfortable speaking up. So mm-hmm. it doesn't happen overnight. It's a journey, yeah. and I don't think it's a journey that ever ends. But. And I'm sure it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, but I think you've both provided really strong examples of where teams could start. And I think To both of your points, it starts at the beginning of someone's journey at a hospital. You have to immediately start to make it clear what the culture around safety reporting is in order for them to feel comfortable engaging. So I appreciate you both answering that question. The last question I have for you to close out the conversation is just, 
Any advice you would give fellow safety and quality teams to observe Patient Safety Awareness Week specifically? I imagine it's tied to some of the things you've already mentioned, but Nicole, you want to kick us off? Well, I think, you know, over the years for Patient Safety Week, we've done many different things. And I think sometimes the small gestures go a long way with staff. We do leader rounding um, and we present, you know, certain information to groups and we give them, you know, bags of chips or it's hospital week and we provide them with, they love Cracker Jacks. Everyone goes crazy over <laughs> Cracker Jacks. Um, do they still have toys in them? Simple. They still have like tattoos or toys okay. in them and they're always like ripping them open and trying to see what toy did you get? <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So sometimes like the small gestures yeah. make people so happy or mm -hmm. having, you know, ice cream for the day, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so so that's one thing that we plan on doing is during our later rounds is that we're going to give out some treats yeah. um, and we're going to thank people for the work that they do and thank you for, you know, your improvements in patient safety. Thank right. you for contributing to, you know, our organizational goal to become a high reliability organization. Mm -hmm. And plus, we're going to celebrate our successes. So, you know, we'll talk about the units that had, you know, the most improved decrease in falls. You know, we'll talk about our different teams that are reporting the more the most good catches. Mm -hmm. Last year for Safety Week, we had a celebration on a department that had a lot of submissions for good catches. They were just knocking it out of the park. Wow. You know, so we brought them in donuts, coffee, and, you know, had a good time. Mm -hmm. So we'll just use department huddles as a platform and then also, you know, our leadership huddle to talk about safety, just awareness of safety. We'll probably have some contests, you know, some prizes mm -hmm. to that as well. Yeah. I appreciate that you mentioned just like the celebration of employees because I think people think like, oh, we'll just give them some treats. But it's beyond that. I think everyone likes to hear thank you for what you're doing. And that recognition probably goes a really long way for the teams. So anything you'd add, Nadine? Yeah, one of the things we're doing for the organization, and it touches on our back to the basics and our speaking up campaign. Mm -hmm. So our focus for patient safety awareness is uh, week is speaking up for patient safety. Mm -hmm. So we have seven hospitals throughout our organization. So what we're doing is we're putting up posters generally where the cafeteria is because that's where everybody goes. And then a table that has the posters that talks about the different tools and how why it's important to speak up and the barriers for speaking up. So we'll have posters and then we'll be refilling the candy all over the table for the mm -hmm. week. Everybody likes that. We're going to be doing a contest where it will be a survey monkey where an employee can go do a little five-question survey, mm -hmm. or a little quiz actually about the safety tools that we're presenting. And oh, nice. we're actually going to build a situation and say, what tool would you use to address this situation? Oh, so, good. And then we'll just pick some winners from that. Mm -hmm. um, we also focus on our good catch. We do quarterly good catch awards. Uh, we have great little Yeti tumblers that say Zero Harm Hero on them. Oh, so nice. So somebody wins one of those. Uh, and then we're going to focus on a safety behavior every day. And at our daily safety briefings, which is all our leadership that comes together, they're going to take that back to their teams and they're going to bring back examples during the week of their teams using some of those tools. So, mm -hmm. so that's going to be our main focus. But I know other organizations, there's just a plethora of different things you can do for Patient Safety yeah. Awareness Week. Yeah, what I'm hearing is a lot of communication and a lot of recognition goes a long way in this work. So I appreciate you both so much for taking the time to come and be guests on the podcast. It's I've learned so much. I think that there's a lot to take away from this conversation. Is there anything that we didn't cover that either of you would like to share about the art committee or about anything happening at your hospitals that you would want to mention? I would just mention that we did at one of our hospitals, our Alpena Hospital, we did have a quarterly Speak Up Award winner yes. over about a year ago. So that was very exciting and that was very much celebrated. So I yeah. just wanted to say I appreciate MHA for not only having that program, but the amount of attention they give to each winner to actually physically go and congratulate and present that was just amazing. So yeah. I do thank them for that. Yeah, well, we thank the employees who are doing the work to keep our hospitals safe and, and provide quality care. So I, I can provide more information about the Speak Up Awards in our um, the episode's description too, so that people can learn more if they're interested in nominating anybody. Nicole, anything that you would add going on in your world? Well, I love the Speak Up Award, and I'm from Alpena, so I'm oh. very grateful that <laughs> Alpena won. Uh, we also have had a final, two finalists, and we had one Speak Up Award winner. So we love the partnership with MHA and the Speak Up Award. 
And I think just in reflection of Safety Week, you know, Nadine talked about, you know, foundations of safety and safety behaviors. And I think that's a really good way to embed, you know, our practices and safety and healthcare to give them some guidelines as to what it means to speak up for safety. Mm -hmm. Um, And I like that you were saying that you're going to use the safety behaviors in your daily huddles, because that's something that we use a safety behavior and we talk about one every day. And we use an example of how we're applying that to our department. So we rotate departments. We have a calendar where someone talks about a safety story every single day to kick off our huddle. Um, And so that just resonated with me that you're also focusing on that work. And then I just wanted to say thank you to MHA for, you know, navigating through the challenges that we have and working together to improve and also overcome our barriers to improve patient safety and continue to provide high quality care. Yeah. Well, thank you for the two of you for all the work that you do and for the committee's work. I'm excited to hear more We'll have to circle back in the next year or so and learn more about some of the trends you're seeing. Maybe next Patient Safety Awareness Week, I'll invite the two of you back here to tell us more. But in the meantime, thank you so much. I appreciate you both. Thank Thank you you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you for listening to the My Care Champion cast. We encourage anyone interested in learning more about the offerings from the MHA Keystone Center PSO or the Adverse Events Review Committee to email keystone at mha.org, which is included in the description of the episode. Thanks. We'll be back next month.